Hi, Simon. Uh, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us for the next wave. You know, during this pandemic time, it's really hard to do things face to face, but I'm glad at least we can be able to do this virtually. So let's start with ARM. You know, I think, of course, I am privileged and, and been involved with ARM for many years as a customer, as a board member, as a partner, but not everybody knows ARM. So I think it'll be worthwhile for you to uh, educate the audience about the role of ARM, what does ARM do, and a little bit of a historical perspective as well. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, thanks for um, having me today. It's great to catch up. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. It's, it's good to see you. Um, so yeah, ARM is a, is a slightly unusual business. We often get described as a, as a chip company, but, but that isn't what we do. What we do in our, in our core business is design microprocessors. Uh, but instead of um, putting them inside chips and selling chips, what we do is license the designs to semiconductor companies for them to use as a building block within much more complex um, devices that they're making. Uh, the company will be 30 years old in uh, November. Uh, so about to celebrate a, a big milestone. And at the time the company got formed, um, semiconductor manufacturing technology was just getting to the point where it was feasible to start building much more complex chips that became systems in their own right. Up to that point, if you wanted to build a system, you took a bunch of chips which had individual discrete functions and you built the system on a printed circuit board. Um, and with each generation of process technology, uh, we've been able to cram more and more transistors into a chip. And so that gave rise to the ability to put those systems inside a single piece of silicon. So when the company was formed, the idea was, well, uh, we have this low power, uh, energy efficient microprocessor. Uh, I wonder if it's gonna turn out to be useful to embed that inside a more complex chip. We didn't know what the killer application was going to be, uh, but it turns out that in pretty much every application, Embedding a microprocessor, adding intelligence, turns out to be incredibly useful. Yeah, I mean, I remember the discussions at the boardrooms, and we're looking at a number of applications, and it's just incredible how widely ARM architecture has been adopted around the world. And obviously, for consumers that doesn't know much about ARM, they probably have no idea that they actually are living with ARM every day. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the, the business model of, of licensing technology to other chip companies to enable them to put intelligence into, into a chip, to build an ecosystem around it, has proven to be uh, incredibly successful. We have today um, over 500 different companies around the world building chips based on the ARM architecture. There's a big ecosystem around that providing software and um, other design services to, to make that all happen. Um, but the real kind of uh, the, the real impact though is in all the consumer devices, all the devices that go into um, enterprise networks and, and drive the internet. Um, there are just so many of them that are now based on on the ARM architecture. Um, over the history of the company, there have been now over 180 billion chips uh, built using uh, the ARM architecture, which is, which is quite an outstanding uh, number. Um, it took something like uh, 11 or 12 years to get to the first billion chips. Um, and now our, our licensees, our partners ship more than 22 billion a year. I mean, it, it's quite incredible. There's something like over 700 per second being manufactured. The, the scale is just astronomical. That is incredible number and incredible reach. For small company, they came out of Cambridge and uh, today it has a huge footprint that all of us in the world are living with, anybody that has mobile phones, or anybody that has the automotive uh, applications, or embedded applications like robotics has ARM in it. You may want to give some perspective around what did it take for you to build such a, what I call the digital architecture of choice in today's world that came out of Cambridge, UK? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to sort of uh, pinch myself to, to think about just e exactly what we've achieved. When I, I joined the company right at the beginning. I was lucky enough to be the, the 16th employee, and we were in a converted turkey barn in the middle of the Cambridge countryside. And 
the technology span out of a British computing company called Acorn. It was a joint venture with Apple. Uh, Apple wanted this processor to put inside the Apple Newton, if you remember that, the, the first uh, digital personal assistant. Um, and uh, you know, we, we just kind of looked for other applications where this technology might be useful. Um, we went you know, knocking on doors and, and trying to convince people that if they wanted to put a processor inside their chip, it would be a good thing to uh, help try and establish a global standard, a standard around which we could build this ecosystem that would drive down the cost of implementing a, a processor inside a chip. We knew from day one there was no way we could do everything ourselves. And so we set out to build a network of partners who were going to be able to, to use the technology uh, and to prosper from using their technology by building their businesses around this standard. So the goal really, you know, genuinely from day one was to create a global standard um, that would make it very efficient to um, put this intelligence inside chips. Uh, and that's turned out to be you know, incredibly successful. That's the kind of philosophy that we've taken to it build the company based around partnership and ecosystem. Samsung team really appreciate the partnership that ARM has given and all of our mobile phones and TVs and others have an ARM architecture in it, like multiple of them in actually even one phone. So it just shows the power of the processors and ecosystem that the ARM team has driven. You also took this strategy of partnership and building an ecosystem of others to join in, which made it even stronger. But also you had an angle of providing low power, which I think if you think about traditional players, focus on more of our performance at power, and it's always driving huge power footprint. And I think how what you have done in some ways, that idea of this innovative dilemma coming from the below and just hitting it on the incumbent, not being able to even deal with the kind of equation that you've been working on is an interesting lesson for uh, how the new architecture can come. Of course, it took time, but it does show the new architecture can come uh, at the right time when you are patient and you build ecosystem and partners. It's an interesting discussion that I'd like to get your perspective on this. At the time that the company was formed, it said that certainly that the process technology was uh, you know, really improving rapidly and it enabled computing to evolve in, in two different directions at once. There was the how much performance can I squeeze out of these transistors that are put into a chip and my only constraint is you know, how much electricity can I get from a wall socket and that was one way to go. And then there was the, the this idea that uh, if you can eliminate as much power as possible then you open the door to many many devices which could then run on batteries. Um, and that was the angle that we took. So we always looked for how can we simplify the design? How can we really analyze the design to look at where the power is being consumed and use smart circuit techniques, smart architectural techniques to make the, the processor as energy efficient as we possibly can. And so every time when we're looking at a new design, we're thinking, what is the trade-off? How much power have I got? And how much performance can I deliver with the technology within that power budget? And that's how we think about the design process. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, the, the way our business model evolved, it was about licensing to others. So we really had to think about our success coming when that licensee of ours actually got into production. So as well as our own technology, we were thinking about who else do we need to work with? What about the, the companies that provide EDA software, the software that's used to actually design a chip? Let's go and work with them. Let's go and think about how quickly a chip designer can get through the design process using our IP and their tools. Let's think about the end manufacturing technology. So we're always thinking about energy efficiency. You know, that's, that's important in anything that, that you're carrying around in your pocket, of course, but it's actually important everywhere. And then how can we optimize across an ecosystem to produce the best result? What makes it unique is the fact, unlike other players, you're not just making product but you are making and building ecosystem so that the customer and customer can be successful by providing the better tools and better alignment to the manufacturing, skew, all those type of things. It's incredible what you have done to accelerate the development of new electronics by not being able to design these very traditional custom compute engines. And then you, of course, add other blocks like graphics and networking, 
as well as interface logics and all those different blocks that people need to build the chips, they made it easier for them to do it. So I think, I think this, this whole idea of creating digital architecture is really a, a modular architecture. And I think I'm, in a way, pioneered it from traditional uh, compute perspective. And you made a migration to much a, um, a next generation approach. And the question I guess I have is now, what's next coming, given that some of the announcement that was made by NVIDIA that wants to have them? Um, so I'd like to get your perspective of what is your view of synergy? Why do you think NVIDIA will benefit uh, by working with ARM to take care of and provide the benefits to your customers? The applications for computing have grown and grown and grown over the years. You know, the, the ability to put so much intelligence into a piece of silicon for such little cost um, has just uh, driven a, an explosion of the number of, of end devices. And of course, we, we live our lives today you know, with, with mobile devices, with, with just all this electronics that we take for granted. But the, the, and whilst we've driven a lot of efficiency and, and advances in the compute engines that are in these, uh, these silicon chips, um, the, the nature of that computing has been fairly constant over the years. Um, it, it's running conventional code that's been taught in universities for years and years. There is a transition coming though. Over the last little while, we've seen massive improvements in the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, and we look at the next generation of computing being a combination of, of classical computing and AI-driven computing where data uh, is being used to make decisions and being used to make decisions in an autonomous way through algorithms that are effectively using machine learning and AI techniques to, to extract information and, and look for patterns within that data. So I, I think the nature of computing is changing. We've been uh, uh, studying that, we've been uh, expanding our own products to um, provide machine learning accelerators, to provide software frameworks to allow applications to be built. And NVIDIA have been, uh, been driving that in, in, you know, to, to huge success. Uh, thinking about very high performance uh, applications for AI. Now, we, both companies, we see AI just going everywhere, being as pervasive in the future um, as conventional computing is today. And we believe that if we take the strengths of ARM, uh, the ability to uh, create pervasive technology, <clears throat> to be able to create ecosystems around what we do, we take that and we, add, and we combine it with uh, the strengths of NVIDIA. Um, the, all the work they've done on really high performance AI compute, the work they've done on the, the software stack to enable applications to be built. We put that together, uh, we think that creates a, a really compelling future in delivering how we deliver this next generation of compute. So, so that's what's behind the, the acquisition. Given the importance of ARM and its architecture for really number of uh, devices that are based on what we call digital architecture, uh, and you, I think you mentioned 190 billion. Soon by the time we are done with our interview, maybe it'll be 191 billion. <laughs> it's accelerating. But um, you know, the safety and security is something that people are really a, a, a worry about as the architecture proliferates and reaching the mass uh, number of devices. So I wanna just get your perspective around what, are, what, are, what is ARM doing about the security? Yeah, it's, it's a huge subject for us and, it, and it's, a, it's a sort of um, uh, horizontal um, technology that, that cuts across absolutely everything that we're doing. To your point, you can, you can build like in, incredibly secure systems and then you find it's the smallest, cheapest thing that created the entry point into the network. So specifically around that, we've been looking at how people build uh, secure IoT devices uh, for some time, uh, some time now. We, we introduced uh, what we call the, the Platform Security Architecture, PSA, which is a set of guidelines for how people build very small, very low cost um, IoT uh, devices, but have a, an architecture that then enables secure software to be built on top of them. So by, by <clears throat> defining the, the kind of building blocks that need to be within the chip, um, how to partition memory up, how to keep uh, encryption keys away, uh, from, from main memory, how to uh, partition algorithms, uh, how to build a secure operating system. That's really important because in a world of uh, a trillion connected things, a world of billions and billions of, of IoT devices, it only takes one uh, for the bad actor to be able to get into the network and we, we want to do everything that we can to try and prevent that. Um, 
We've also been thinking about how software on those devices get managed through its lifetime. Um, any computer that you might use, you, know, you, you can have uh, operating system updates pushed to it if there's a security issue. We need that to be in place for absolutely everything that's connected to the network. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge piece of work that's, uh, that is ahead of us for, for the industry. And then, as you say, uh, sec security needs to go everywhere. We're, we're thinking about how <clears throat> um, big CPUs that sit in cloud data centers, how are the, the applications within them se uh, separated from each other? How does the hardware help support that? Um, how do you contain um, something if there is, uh, if, if some um, application does get penetrated, how do you contain it so it can't get into the rest of the system? It's driving changes in the base architecture. It's driving changes in the way that software is written um, across all of these devices. Um, and again, we're taking a very partnership-based approach uh, to try and help address these problems, working with people, um, thinking about what solution is going to be needed, not just tomorrow, but five, ten years from now, and thinking through the, the changes in the architecture that are going to be required to deliver that. So it's a huge piece of work, but one that's crucially important for us. As you know, when I was on the board, mobile phone was a major driver, and it was in two ways. The volume was going up, and you know, it was hitting one and a half billion units per, per, uh, per year, and then they were shipping multiple ARM processors per phones. So this multiplier effect was really great for ARM's growth in during late, you know, early, late, I guess, the 2000s and early 2010 uh, uh, era. But now with mobile phone, a bit saturating because everybody has a phone, uh, what do you see the next big growth for ARM going forward? Yeah, I mean, the, the growth of mobile has been phenomenal for, for the company and, and we've had two waves of it, the initial wave of uh, digital mobile phones and, and then smartphones. Um, and, and over the years, uh, you know, we've seen ARM technology being used in, in many other applications. But I think, I think we're, we're at a moment now where um, the, the growth of semiconductors look, looks really, really uh, positive for the, for the years ahead. And it's a number of markets that are driving that growth. Um, we're seeing the, the, the deployment of 5G. 5G is way more complex than 4G, so it's, it's driving the adoption of more um, processing within all of the chips that, uh, that build up the 5G network. And then on top of that, you, you have the growth of IoT. That's billions of devices. They're really small, but they're enormously high volume devices. That's a driver. We have autonomous vehicles, highly complex um, you know, data centers on wheels uh, that need to be um, driven, pardon the pun, um, in a way that, that makes them really energy efficient, but enables a massive of, uh, of compute power to do everything that an autonomous vehicle requires. So there are all of these things going on at once, and this combination of um, AI as, a, as a, the, the kind of core element of processing, 5G networks, IoT, this is all happening together, uh, and I think it's going to drive the growth of the semiconductor industry for years to come. And then the other place uh, that, that I mentioned is, is the data center and, and the, you know, the cloud is, is growing like crazy. Um, mm -hmm. And that's another area where through our um, focus around energy efficiency, we're able to provide some real benefits there as the cloud expands um, with the performance that we're now delivering. Uh, we're, we're starting to see more deployments of ARM processors in the cloud as well. And that's an area people, you know, once upon a time thought we'd never be able to address, but uh, but today we are. So a lot of these applications are very exciting and actually these are all the footprint of what's driving the demand for the uh, devices as well as the uh, applications that are making our lives better, right? Uh, technology and compute power can help improve um, uh, our day-to-day -day living. But there are so many other areas where this deployment of computing, the, the deployment of IoT devices, the use of AI, uh, can be used to address some of the, the hardest problems that the world's going to face over the coming years. You know, things like uh, climate change, things like growing population, things like pollution, you know, everything that's uh, encapsulated by uh, the UN Global Goals. These are areas where technology can make a big difference. And it's, it's something I know it's a, an area of focus for you personally, Young. I know it's an area of focus for, for Samsung. Uh, and it's something that we're big believers in, that the technology can help play a role. I actually do appreciate um, also being supportive of the uh, initiative that I 
also started uh, called Extreme Tech Challenge. Startup companies uh, using technology and innovation, entrepreneurship to solve the um, sustainability issues. And uh, I'm hoping that all of us in corporations, they can be able to work with startups to accelerate these innovations. So I'm going to continue to support and push Extreme Tech Challenge. And I also know that you have uh, 2030 goals that you've been pushing as a part of the uh, same agenda in a uh, different scale in the time frame. Yeah, I, I, I think that the key thing about, about what we're doing in, in various different ways is um, that this evolution of compute power has, has been incredible. It, it's, it's giving us these you know, mobile phones that we can play games on and do cool stuff, but the, the, the potential impact goes way beyond that. And, and what I've seen through ARMS history is um, if, if you continue to drive down the cost, if you drive up the performance, if you make it easy for people to get access to these technologies, then what you do is, is kind of spark their own imagination. You, you, you enable people to come up with the ideas that you couldn't have possibly have thought of no matter how many smart people you've got within your company, because you've got these kind of business uh, objectives that you have to deliver on. But if you can put all those tools in the hands of, of other people, then they come up and, and they create great ideas. And through Extreme Tech Challenge and through what we're doing in 2030 Vision, um, it, it helps uh, highlight that. And, and with these, these technologies that we put in people's hands, I'm really optimistic that we're gonna see great solutions coming around um, that, that do solve some of the world's biggest problems. Yeah, we need to partner, power up, and solve some bigger problems and make some impact, right? I'm so happy to hear that. I'm so glad we also we can be a partner in multiple levels, including this particular agenda, which I believe is really an important one. Well, Simon, I really appreciate your time today. We had a very, you know, variety of discussions, but uh, we have a long history, and I believe we can really work together. And I think fundamentally, um, really bring the partnership into the uh, ecosystem, and that's what made it possible in my view. Well, thanks for sharing. I really appreciate that. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of questions. <laughs>